Dear participants, welcome to TPA Global Webinar. Scanbab's challenge has been mitigated by moving to a central operating business model. I would like to introduce to you our today's panelists. Uh, Raymond Gerardou, a partner of TPA Global, who has over 26 years of experience gained both in advisory and industry roles. In addition, Raymond uh, was a head of global, uh, global head of tax in Swiss-based multinational, uh, where he was mandated to set up and manage the global tax department from the very beginning. Raymond is a, a regular speaker on roundtables and conferences. Uh, our second panelist is Han Koops, partner in Wunder Partners, uh, who has 15 years of experience in industry at DuPont and ICI, uh, in addition line management experience in controlling and supply chain, and 10 years uh, consulting experience at Wunder Partners. Dear participants, welcome, and I give you a word. Thank you very much, Maria. This is Raymond Charity speaking. Welcome, everybody. Um, today, we're going to be talking about, um, you know, whether the BEPS challenges can be mitigated by moving to a central operating model, as the title already indicated. On this slide, which I'm going to skip very quickly, will you see the content? Maria, next page, please. What are the challenges today of your organizations as multinational enterprises? I think everybody has a, has a good picture of what today's challenges are with a global economy, a lot of political changes all over the world. Um, more and more regulations are coming into place, last but not least, in the, uh, in the area of tax, just to name BEPS. On the other hand, if we look at the, um, at the business, uh, there is a lot of new technologies um, who come and change business models that we knew. It, we refer to it as the Internet of Things, uh, which drives a lot of challenges for organizations to adapt. Uh, with it comes also a lot of changes in the behavior uh, of customers. They go in complete different directions than what we were used to. Uh, and in particular, then, for an organization to remain sustainable uh, is, a, is a very important question to answer pos positively, uh, but that means a lot of adaptation is required from an organization. What are the consequences or some of the consequences of these uh, challenges? We see at the minimum a lot of uh, compliance issues popping up left, right, center, especially if we focus in the tax area. I think, Hank, you may want to uh, quickly talk about the, um, the the second bullet point there on the consequences. Yes, good uh, good afternoon everybody, uh, Hank Copes. Um, now what we see at our customers is that uh, next to uh, regulatory uh, changes and tax changes, you know, there are a lot of things happening in business reality that require a lot of uh, swift adaptation as well. Uh, particularly technology driven, driven internet, digitalization, uh, changes in consumer behavior, they're all areas where companies need to react very quickly because competitors can move very fast at times and once things have hit the market they tend to take on a dynamic of their own and before you know it you're, uh, you're running behind and we see that in a number of areas uh, in the, with our clients. Thanks. Um, what, does the, what are the consequences as well is that in order for an organization to be able to deal with all these challenges, more and more are we seeing a trend towards global control around decision making, around uh, choices to be made, etc., which thus requires a more centrally managed uh, organization. Um, and last but not least, uh, it all brings uh, more stricter compliance in a number of areas, which again drives for uh, a more central-oriented uh, approach in order to keep track of all these requirements and manage them and, and adhere to them. Maria, can you please turn the page?
what are some of the root causes of this? Um, why companies have all these challenges, I must say. The root causes of why you know, these companies have these challenges is that traditionally companies grew organically. They were set up in you know, a way that we are just depicting. It's just an example, but some of you may uh, recognize ways of how your organization in terms of legal entity structures is built up and how it serves its markets. Um, over time, when companies grow, they need more of these uh, legal entity boxes. Uh, they do more acquisitions because they want to grow, and as a result, uh, the world is even getting more complex. Um, there is a lot of interaction. We have drawn here some arrows, red, green, black, between legal entities, especially when uh, a legal entity is more driven on a local level, whereas the business is more global or regional. We see multiple management lines kicking in in order to keep track of what is happening in all regions, in all business lines or divisions or segments as you may call it, i.e. we see a lot of uh, organizations that have matrix organizations, sometimes very complex, uh, in order to manage basically the global company. It creates thus complexity, complexity in communication. Uh, what it also does, in effect, it has created a lot of, um, shall I say, slack in the sense that if the company has to adapt to new changes, then it might be slow in adapting to them because of its very rigorous um, organizational structure. Um, so this is one of the root causes that you have a complex organization built over years with a lot of heritage, especially if you do acquisitions and there is not a full integration happening of each and every one of them, um, that can create even more complex organizations as we just, you know, give you here as an example. Can you turn the page, Maria? What are further root causes? We just go from left to right. Organic growth is what I just uh, mentioned. Uh, we have created a business model for our organization which is maybe 10 years old and now the world is changing upon us and there is maybe internet uh, available whereas I'm still doing it in the old-fashioned way. Um, mergers and acquisition as I mentioned, maybe due to implementation costs post-close which run through the P&L, management decides not to fully integrate to save some costs and so show already some synergies that they announce on the market. Uh, which means that you do not integrate maybe in an efficient way. Um, as I mentioned before, the imbalance of a, a centralized versus decentralized operating model. Hank, you may want to touch briefly on that one. Yeah, what is meant by that is, is that, uh, you know, picture five, slide five, showed you, let's say, the, the traditional uh, historically developed uh, setup of, uh, of a lot of uh, M&Es. Um, but that does not ref necessarily reflect, you know, the way that the business needs to operate in terms of, you know, purely from a business content point of view. So what we fi often find is, is that there is an imbalance in, you know, how you're actually structured and what you would require from a business perspective. And that has all to do with the number of layers you have, let's say, between local and central as a result of country organization, organizations, legal entity, uh, effects, etc. Um, and that also reflects in terms like uh, ERP systems. Um, I mean, many companies will operate a single SAP system, but even having a single SAP system does not mean that you have a centrally run SAP system. Within one system, you can do a lot of customization, fine-tuning, adaptation, whatever. And finding that balance in how much do I control centrally? How much is, lo is controlled locally? You know, that is a difficult question at times, and historical uh, organizational setups sometimes interfere with that, and then you see the business reality uh, not coming out uh, the way that uh, that you had intended it, and that is a, a common problem we see, we recognize with uh, with a lot of our uh, of our customers. If you look at the next one, 
trade barriers and tax regimes. What do we mean by that? Um, as, as we all know, every country typically has its own tax regime. That's a, a very simple and straightforward one. But also, company, countries are starting to, um, while well starting, have always had barriers for trade to protect their own industries or their typical industries. Those kinds of elements are still around us and, and, and create, um, you know, issues around accessing markets on a more global basis. And then there is the mismatch between what we call the business markets and the regulatory territories. Um, a typical example is you have a business line in your organization that focuses on a region. Uh, and if they report internally, they will report per this division, irrespective of the countries involved. Whereas as a tax person, you probably want to have the local tax information relative to that division carved out and nicely presented to you in the segmented P&L for that. Um, but that might not be the way your SAP system or your business is organized. And as such, you get, um, you know, quite some hassle in getting the financial data that you need for your local tax activities. What does all this mean in terms of root causes? Um, it may be that your organization has a structure, a business structure that is no longer fitting with what your market is actually asking of you. You're, you're asked to, to be global in, in all aspects, but you're also being asked to deliver at a local level. So there is a lot of um, complexity as a result of that, especially if you have not organized yourself in a very central way. What we very often see, and this is many, many times a driver for change in an organization coming from the top, which is that you have created a lot of cost disadvantages in the sense that you may have duplication of offices. The IT support function may have to support what you call the central SAP, but also uh, legacy SAP systems or ERP systems for that matter. Uh, procurement is playing um, a role in the whole thing, but it's maybe not getting its full value out of it. Uh, statutory reporting is forced upon you, which is fitting with this local uh, requirements. The other thing is um, lack of transparency, which is, has to do with reporting. Uh, all the complexity that I just mentioned when you want to report local financial data for tax purposes, whereas the group is reporting more the divisional or segmental information and you have to carve it up by way of Excel spreadsheets. That is not necessarily the easy way to do it. Uh, and last but not least, with uh, a complex organization uh, grown over time, uh, it has maybe difficulty to adapt to new uh, requirements, be it commercial or regulatory, uh, simply because it first has to go through the hierarchy lines, the decision-making trees that you may have in your organization, which makes it a slow adapter, if at all, an adapter to uh, new uh, changes. If we go to the next slide, uh, Maria. And here is one thing that, to the extent you're all tax or transfer pricing people, you will all know this. This is an open door to many of you, but also BAPS has created quite some uh, some scrutiny on this, uh, which stems obviously from the whole political scenery in the in, in the OECD and the G20. Um, I've now started dubbing uh, sort of BAPS as the socks of the tax world. Um, for some of you that may be history, but um, SOX was the Sarbanes-Oxley exercise that a lot of uh, uh, public companies had to go through uh, in creating a lot of processes and centrally managed processes to get control over their financial reporting. Uh, it almost seems that BEPS is that for the tax function where we need to get more uh, disclosures, more alignment between uh, what you file in your tax returns and your transfer pricing reports and you are being challenged through the country by country reporting. But what does it do more is that it creates uh, a lot of uh, pressure around interest deductions where you have a limitation potentially hitting you if EBIT levels are not sufficient. Um, obviously in, the, in your structures you may find that having activities in one country whereas uh, being booked for others, you have uh, PE issues. Um, hybrid structures is just one example of what is referred to as more aggressive tax planning opportunities are disappearing one after the other. 
and the last but not least the whole story about people functions where you really need from a tax point of view ideally have the right people in the right location doing the right thing for you to be able to sustain what you are claiming is your um, your transfer pricing set up an allocation of profits all the way through the value chain um, what has it done to uh, you know the view of for instance a CEO or a CFO uh, in a multinational if you look at the picture in front of you where it says on the right hand side the balance in in the old days I would refer to it as planning would deliver quite some dollars cost of compliance were relatively light net balance of this is a you know a good benefit for the organization and as a head of tax you would be able to say I'm a profit center rather than a cost center what we're seeing happening now with all uh, aspects of what we just discussed we are seeing the world shifting towards more compliance disclosure requirements to document you name it uh, financial transparency better financial data in the tax function require more compliance to be taken care of more processes to be managed ie compliance costs dramatically gone up whereas the opportunity for planning has been a bit more restricted and as such uh, we are seeing already CFOs and CEOs looking at tax department and saying you need to cut your cost you need to um, get more in automation you need to get more control over what you're doing on your compliance side and that's sort of what this balance is trying to to show us here that's the world I think we tax people seem to be living in uh, from now on um, and what does this uh, bring us all where do we have opportunity still going forward uh, does then a more centrally controlled tax department a central managed operational model is that the answer to all our questions probably not but is it an answer that could help us in certain areas most likely yes and I think we would like to show you a little bit what what that could look like how that could look like and with this I uh, ask you Maria to change to to go to the next page and Hank to take it from there yes thank you very much um, you know, we uh, discussed on uh, on slide five the the, the traditional setup um, with it, a number of its disadvantages in terms of uh, one complexity, uh, also in terms of responsiveness, and uh, certainly also in terms of transparency because there's a lot of numbers flowing within the organization, not necessarily flowing outside uh, from outside uh, in and then outside again, but you know circling around in the organization and uh, it may well be worthwhile to consider a model that you know has a better fit with the way your business is structured and, and your whole value creation is uh, is actually uh, designed and we're going to discuss that a little bit more on the next few pages and also uh, what we mean with uh, uh, how you uh, how you can look at those uh, those elements um, and one of the extreme examples of that are extreme but one of the uh, examples of that is a single business entity and we'll go into that model a little bit as well but first we would like to explain uh, what we mean by a business operating model because if you want to change your business operating model you need to look at a couple of things at the same time uh, and what we mean by a business model is the way that the organization interacts with the outside world uh, of particular relevance of course the suppliers and the, and the customers but your whole values uh, creation process takes place internally and it's, uh, it happens uh, within a certain legal and fiscal structure uh, your business processes drive uh, uh, you know the way you do things but again within a certain fiscal legal structure uh, the way you set up your purchasing the way you set up your sales uh, is very much impacted by the way you set up yourself in terms of fiscal uh, design uh, of course you know you need to look at the organization uh, similarly again 
you know, having just having legal entities has an effect on your organization. Um, a part of a very important part of your business operating model. Uh, your people, depending on how you're organized and what kind of businesses you run, you need people with certain skill sets and, uh, and capabilities, experiences, and everything needs to be supported with, uh, with systems and, uh, and data. And those elements together uh, we describe as the, as the business operating model, and it describes you know, how have you organized yourself to get the job done that you need to do. Um, and uh, the, um, if you look at, uh, at becoming more in control and having a better balance between, you know, how do I do, what do I do locally, what do I do uh, centrally, and how, am I, how, how can I get into a, a better control from a central perspective, you need to look at those things in unison because they influence each other. Um, and if you sub-optimize on one of these elements, you know you will be in. Uh, you will be back to uh, let's say slide five. Um, and that is uh, so. Th that is this is what describes what we mean by a business operating model. Uh, and in the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about the significance of your legal fiscal setup in this. Um, your legal system, this is described a little bit as a sort of an equalizer, like you would find on, uh, on audio uh, equipment or video equipment. And in a way, your legal and fiscal setup acts as a sort of a master switch for the degrees of freedom you have with your business processes with your organization and with your systems and data. And what we mean by that is, is if you operate uh, in a very uh, traditional model where you have legal entities all over the world, all having an arm's length intercompany relationship with each other, then it will become very difficult to move towards, let's say, more standardized processes. Uh, and why? Because uh, you create a lot of degrees of freedom locally, and usually freedom that you create is going to be used. So your business processes are going to be challenged constantly for local adaptation, fine-tuning. Uh, you bring in a new manager from a country somewhere from, uh, from another company, and uh, he wants to do the way uh, the, the things the way he did it at, the, uh, at his previous company, and all of a sudden everything is challenged, and you know your business processes will slowly slip back from let's say more central control to a local control. Very much the same is true for almost everything else for the way you set up your organization and you know for your systems and data. Uh, your legal fiscal setup is the master switch and that means that if you structure yourself a little bit more towards having a more centrally managed uh, organization and you align your legal and fiscal setup to that then all of a sudden uh, business processes are limited in the degree of freedom so that means that they will not be able to move past the, the area on the right where they are, uh, where the legal fiscal setup is. As an example, um, if you have legal entities operating at arm's length, uh, that means you have intercompany transactions, that means that whatever way you set it up, uh, you uh, need to have local sales processes configured in the, for the legal entity whether you do it at an SAP or in any other system, you need to configure things for a certain local, local legal entity. If, however, uh, you move to a more principal agent-driven setup, then all of a sudden business processes start taking place within one legal entity. And your sales processes are configured for only one legal entity, the principal. And that means by definition, they can no longer move towards a more local perspective. 
that is the significance of this slide, and it also shows you, you know, the the, the significance of thinking about uh, or the importance of thinking about, you know, the legal fiscal setup in line with your business reality, uh, in order also to support centralization, centralization or decentralization of your business processes, your organization, and your systems and data. Uh, and we wanted to share this with you. Um, because it also shows why it is important to look at those things in unison and not in isolation. Um, they really are linked together, and that's what's reflected in this uh, in this picture. Can we move to the next slide, Maria? Yeah. Um, what we would like to share with you as uh, as one of the models uh, that is very uh, must get at finding the optimum balance between local and central. Uh, we would like to share the concept of a single business entity with you. This is a concept and it is a, an example of a legal fiscal design that uh, is fully geared to having full central control, moving towards standardization, harmonization, and at the same time, you know, still have your local uh, customer intimacy, and this is also known as the principal taller agent uh, model, where you take all of your commercial processes and all of your commercial value, and you make that owned by one legal entity, which you then call the single business entity. And this single business entity uh, does all the purchasing, it does all the selling, and it will own all commercial stocks. So it will be the owner of all purchased materials, of all finished goods, and it will also own all work in process in, uh, in the factories. Your sales organization is then, uh, in this model, set up as, as an agency structure, and all of your manufacturing is, is set up as store converters. Now, this model has a number of advantages. Um, it allows you to uh, have full central control. Uh, it makes things very transparent because it actually takes out the legal entity dimension to a great extent. And the legal entity dimension is not always a true business dimension, uh, but it is a dimension in your uh, business operating model, and it has an effect on increasing complexity and decreasing transparency. And with this model, you, you take this out. Um, and uh, it also allows you to very clearly define, okay, where are all my, what is the, the, value, uh, the value adding of all of my activities? And independent of your legal entities, you know, structure how you want to, uh, how you want to organize this, and uh, at the heart of this, you know, it should be uh, driven by your business requirements. It should be driven by the impact it has on your EBIT, but at the same time, it has a lot of impact on your uh, uh, on your on your fiscal uh, planning and uh, and setup, because it allows you to play with, okay, where do I want to put which functionalities, or where is my functionality located, and in the simplest uh, form possible, you know, uh, make all of your fiscal aspects, your transfer pricing, fit with, with your true business reality. Um, this is the concept. Uh, it's a simple picture. There's a lot more to it. Um, for the moment, I wanted to leave it uh, with this. But this is uh, a model on the far right of the of the equalizer scale, where you uh, are fully organized for central control, and at the same time creating local freedom by taking out uh, the legal entity dimension. Uh, if you could go to the next uh, next slide, please, Maria. Um, the benefits that you will see from this uh, from this model are from a centralized model, because there are many variations possible to the concept of an SBE. 
you can do it for the whole organization, you can do it for parts of the organization, like only the supply chain uh, or only sales. Uh, all variations are possible. Um, but it creates a number of, of, uh, of benefits. And certainly also from a tech perspective, one of the big benefits is transparency. Why transparency? Because all of your commercial processes are owned by one legal entity. That means that you have a single set of data that is not uh, subject to local interpretation or local uh, tweakings in, uh, in charts of accounts. It all happens in one legal entity. And that also means that you have real life data instantaneously. You do not have to consolidate at the end of the month before you get, uh, before you get your data. Uh, so that creates a lot of internal transparency. Uh, also, everything is geared around business functions and not by some random or, or, or haphazardly chosen uh, legal entity that happens to be there. Uh, it is taken out of the equation, so all of your business processes organization are much more geared towards, uh, towards your, your business. It also helps in standardization of the data, which is, you know, if everything is run from a single company in terms of uh, commercial processes, you can imagine that you will also have uh, single master data, for instance, for customers, for suppliers. You will have uh, one set of data for product costing, for uh, sales, etc. So you automatically get standardized and single data. You have no ambiguity in your data anymore, no interpretation issues. It makes it easier to adapt to new technologies and at lower cost. Why? Because again, your commercial processes take place in one center. That means you can create a center of excellence around that. It allows you to leverage on synergies of scale, for instance, not only in terms of cost, but also in terms of expertise. If you have, if you need to drive, let's say, uh, technological changes uh, regarding customer apps or something like that, then you do not need to do that on 20 locations. You can do it in one location, and that means that you can have higher qualified people in the central location. And that actually means that it makes you more capable. It makes it easier to respond quickly. Uh, you have better control. Once you have configured something, you can use it for everything. You do not need to configure, to reconfigure or fine-tune it for every uh, local systems variance or process variance that you uh, that you have uh, that you have because you know they disappear with having everything concentrated in a single legal entity. And all of those things also add to efficiency. It becomes a lot easier to operate shared service centers, for instance. Your IT costs uh, go down, uh, and that helps you in bringing down your, uh, your operational cost. Um, on the legal and fiscal part, uh, I would like to hand over to you, Raymond. Yep. Thank you very much, Hank. I think um, you have shared a lot of, uh, of the benefits. I think for the audience, it, it should be good to know, you know, this is obviously the extreme, as uh, Hank already said, you know, where you have one legal entity that is doing uh, your business and you have maybe legal entities or activities outside of that entity. That would be sort of your ideal structure. There are a number of reasons why, uh, you know, that may not be the optimal structure. I just have to mention indirect taxes, VAT customs which uh, sometimes creates havoc on people getting organized in these ways. But what we're trying to give you is the concept where you have a centrally managed controlled organization, where you have people functions hopefully allocated in the right way in the right countries. This gives you that fiscal uh, planning opportunity back in the sense that you may have an opportunity to put these people there where you may want them from a, from a planning perspective. Um, the, the other component is uh, from a 
compliance perspective, if you think about the cost structure that you had or may have now, given that your compliance is going up, the requirements are going up, everybody shouting for more support, which means more people, which means more cost, here you may find that a system that supports such a setup will be easier to manage and you will have much clearer uh, and direct access to the relevant data so that you can become more compliant. So that's a cost uh, effective way uh, for running your, um, your, your, your compliance function and you have more centralized control. Again, this is the extreme of the, um, uh, of the range that you can go, uh, but it is indicative that if you want to get a more centrally managed organization, it will help you get your, your cost down, your compliance more effective, which hopefully frees up time again for some of you to do uh, more value added business and become again a tax department or a unit within the department that is considered a profit uh, center rather than a cost center. Um, the, the fact that you minimize intercompany transactions in this particular case is, is probably crystal clear. There's not a lot of interaction anymore in its, uh, in its ideal world uh, between all these entities which require control, which create intercompany transactions and thus complexity. This is minimized uh, and, and brings costs uh, significantly down. Also, if you look at acquisitions, you know, you have sort of a, uh, a muster that you can use in a copy-paste model way um, and it's pretty rigorous uh, if you can apply it that way. So there's a lot of uh, positive things to say for a more centralized operating model, um, but we all know this is maybe the, uh, the big dream we have. Uh, complexity will remain uh, to a certain extent, uh, but helping your organization moving toward a more centrally managed uh, organization as a whole, and then the tax department, um, maybe more specific for those of you in, the, in those functions, it will ease your life, will bring back uh, more efficiency on the cost side into your department and, and help you to focus more time on bringing value, which is being with the business and helping the business to develop in a mere, more tax efficient way. I think this is uh, for us, um, you know, in a very, very short and concise way, uh, what we want to share with you. Um, I would like to open it up now for questions. If there are any questions, you can uh, put those questions into the box uh, on your screen and we hopefully can, uh, can give you some answers there. Thank uh, you very much. Right. Dear participants, we already have some questions. Oops, sorry. Okay. Uh, so let me read them out loud. Uh, just a sec. Uh, so Alejandro. Uh, is right, and while I agree on the fact that centralizing operations is a good option, uh, putting everything in just one company doesn't seem to be the best option either. Are we talking, uh, if we are talking about m and you need to take into account different time zones, local practices, tax authorities, behaviors, and other characteristics. So maybe going to two, three regional entities might be more suitable. So I think it requires your opinion. I tend to agree with the concept. I think um, uh, whomever wrote this obviously has a clear experience on the market and I think, as I said before, the, um, uh, the drive towards this is to give you a bit of the picture where you can make savings on the cost side, get control over your business. Uh, the world is more complex than that. I mentioned that earlier. Uh, I just have to think about indirect taxes, some logic uh, at the local level uh, in terms of tax authorities taking an approach, mentioned China, um, you know, with its restrictions. You know, there's a number of reasons why you would come to the conclusion, you know, one doesn't fit all, uh, which is a, you know, probably a very fair and, and, and realistic statement. Having said that, at the same time, I think what this webinar tries to do is to motivate people to, to challenge and not to just accept. Uh, everything that the businesses may be doing, but guiding the business in a direction where, you know, we can all have a benefit on having a better operational structure, which is basically the operating model for the business itself, more transparency, but then also for the tax people to have uh, a bit of a say in this and still be able to deliver value. 
and you know it's 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 today's world forcing for compliance forcing disclosure forcing transparency and a lot of companies are are, are really struggling with this so see it as a food for thought without trying to ignore you know the local realities out there which are driven by tax authorities and their approach or you know governments that uh, take a take a you know a different way of how they want their business to be run in their countries hope this answers the question uh, okay thank you Ryan uh, I think we have another question uh, do you think that uh, the SBE model fit in the modern economy development if yes or no, why do you think so? Sorry, I couldn't hear the question 100%, Maria. Can you repeat it, please? Yeah. Uh, does the SBE model fit in the modern economy developments? Uh, if I may answer that one, uh, sure. I think very much so. Um, and the reason for it is, is that um, ASB is a model, you know, which allows you to focus on business instead of uh, legal entities and, uh, and, 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 and uh, regulatory territories. Um, and what you see is, is that more and more markets are not defined by country borders. You know, the markets are defined by either by fellow uh, multinationals or if you're more in the consumer end by demographical developments rather than geographical developments and uh, a lot of developments that are taking place things like Internet of Things but also in new PEPs they are, be, they are global these are global uh, global drivers and I think having a model you know that allows you to adapt to that quickly is certainly uh, certainly fits with, uh, with the modern economy. Uh, okay, we got another question. Uh, what signals uh, should CFO or CEO pick up to move forward to an SBE model? Um, I think one of the things that uh, you could uh, that would be triggers, or that you know that would uh, that would prompt you to uh, to st really start thinking of that. Is uh, for instance, how well are you able, you know, to manage your uh, your administrative costs compared to thing to to your development of revenue? Uh, if you don't see a big uh, synergy of scale effect in there, you know, then you need to question yourself. Uh, there are benchmarks available for that. Um, and that could be a signal. Uh, the other thing is regarding transparency. You know, how often do you run into the single version of the truth, or do you are you confronted with multiple data sets that all claim to be the single version of the truth? Um, and if that is the case, you know, then you may question uh, whether your uh, your data setup is uh, is efficient. Uh, other signals are, you know, the the, the, number, the diversity in your IT systems, um, and also, for instance, how quickly can you respond to challenges like PEPs? How quickly have you gotten your country by country rep uh, reporting organized? How quickly can you uh, fully uh, get all the data on your transfer pricing? And those more would be signals for, particularly from a CFO point of view. Uh, that you know that it may be worthwhile to look at your business operating model. Thank you. Uh, and I think we have a couple of more questions. Uh, what are the challenges of uh, implementing an SBE model and how can you deal with them? You will uh, certainly uh, implementing an SBE would require alignment of uh, of a quite a, a number of uh, of managers. Um, so stakeholder management is uh, is very important. Um, of course, you need a good design that fits with your business reality. Um, you also uh, run the risk because. Uh, it is it is uh, it is a significant change if you want to go into a model like that. 
um, and you can have the idea, but then trying to realize the idea, my, my you know, in as time passes by and other uh, business realities are, uh, are prominent, then um, you know you, you could face an erosion of uh, of attention. Uh, so the best way to approach it is is on a project uh, project way. So run it as a project, um, and then of course you know it requires making sure that everybody understands the model, that everybody is trained uh, in the way the model operates, so you need to pay a lot of attention to change management as well. Thank you. Uh, and I think we have a question following uh, this question. Uh, what are the drawbacks of an FBE model? Because you talked about benefits, so audience is interested about drawbacks. Yeah, if you, if sorry, Hank, if you just look at it, maybe the, the some of the drawbacks, especially in the current uh, setting, is everybody talks about PEs and deemed PEs. If you have a commission model, uh, we all know with agents uh, the discussion. Uh, so theoretically, that is potentially a drawback. Having said that, we are coming across now companies that are set up through legal entity structures. Uh, old style, newer style, with a with a very good supply chain setup, but still, you know, there is a lot of questions popping up all over the place around uh, permanent establishments as a result of the way people do business. Uh, bearing in mind the new uh, approach towards permanent establishments as a result of the uh, the BEPS initiative. So, yes, it's a drawback, and yes, it is a potential issue, uh, but it is conversely also an issue in you know the current structure so you know it is a drawback i think it's uh, it's a point of attention that we all have to deal with in and even in today's world uh, the other aspect is um, the ideal structure as i mentioned already may look simple straightforward and may be you know very much um, a goal uh, for everybody at the same time we know that indirect taxes and customs um, you know, when they get applied, you may have to change a little bit your structure in order to not end up in a trap where you have to pay a lot and have no recovery, for instance, of uh, VAT. So th there are a number of uh, issues to look at like you have in any project. Um, so yes, it is drawback. Uh, at the same time, it is something that belongs to this as a project. And Hank mentioned already, it has to be approached as a project. Uh, but the overarching goal is to get more um, centralized control, simplicity in, in organizational structures and in transparency, which, which brings a lot of the, the cost of compliance, the, the cost of, um, of intercompany transactions and relationships down significantly, uh, which gives not just the tax people a, a benefit, but also the organization as a whole, which is an EBIT improvement uh, area which if you think about it, you're a CFO and CEO may be happy with. Um, Hank, if you have others. Um, no, I think you've, uh, you've covered it quite well. Okay. Uh, I think we're, yeah, we received another question. Uh, in case of going ahead with central uh, centralization model, you need to be very detailed in uh, on the documentation of any kind of functions, assets, risks uh, moved between entities, uh, as all this movement might be questioned, challenged by tax authorities. I think it's also regarding drawbacks. I think that's true, but I think it's also true that um, you know if you have today a value chain which runs over multiple legal entities. Um, and the reporting is uh, on a segment basis, you have some complexity in getting the data points that you need to do exactly what was just mentioned is reporting to the tax authorities. And this matrix uh, is, is creating a lot of um, uh, time pressure and, and um, unless you have one big global fully um, aligned SAP system or ERP system, where you can do just the cut and slice along, you know, legal entity structures or functionality. So if you're a limited risk distributor, you can carve it out as a segmented P&L. 
you know, that's the other ideal world. Um, but unless you have that, you're going to have a lot of uh, discussions happening around what belongs where in reporting to tax authorities. I don't think you get away from complexity of the requirements of what the countries need from you uh, as such. I think you can maybe more streamline it if you align your operating model in a, in a way that it is standardized for multiple countries and you have a system to support that. I think there you have an opportunity to reduce your costs. You still have to report. It doesn't go away. Um, but that's how I see it. Yeah, and if, if yeah. I may add, yeah. I think that, uh, so, you know, you are going to, whatever setup you choose, you're going to be challenged on that anyhow. Yeah? So in that sense, it's not a, I wouldn't perceive it as a drawback because it doesn't create any problems you don't have already. Uh, and certainly with BEPS uh, on its way, you know, you, you can anticipate that you will have those questions regardless of the model that you set up. And the only question is, is okay, which model allows you to manage it most efficiently? And which model allows you to get into compliance mode uh, at, at the lowest cost? And then I think an SBE still has a lot of benefits. Uh, okay, and the last question we have, uh, what are tax-related advantages of an SBE model? Uh, that seems to be a question uh, maybe for me. What are the tax related? I think what we're trying to bring you is, um, you know, if you are able as a tax person to motivate your management to put an SBE in a country where the tax rate is maybe a little bit more beneficial than in, in other high tax areas, you might be able to create uh, a tax benefit for your organization. Uh, which means you have to put it in a country where the tax rate is probably below the 25% average global rate. Um, that is not always working, so maybe you will not do that for your headquarter with all the relevant uh, functions that attract a lot of profit margin. Um, but you can at least start that process maybe on uh, some of the, um, the, one of the questions that came up to set up maybe three uh, SBEs in, um, in the three regions of the world, um, maybe that is a first step. So what is a tax, pure tax play benefit? You need to look at the people functions that attract the, um, the residual profit, if you will, to, to make it now technical a bit, and to try to align those people in those regions where the tax rate is uh, beneficial. Um, an SBE might be a project that helps people to start talking about that and make it debatable and allow it maybe to happen even. Not challenging the, the status quo of the operating model as a whole within an organization will not allow you to go there at all and makes it difficult. And I think this is, to, to a large extent, the dilemma that tax people have because the adagio, we follow business, is, is a very true one uh, but reversely, if the tax people indicate what the benefits to an organization could be if the business adopts, that is not a wrong statement in my humble view, and it is more up to then the business to make it a palatable and acceptable business model operationally, not just a tax uh, benefit that might come out of that. So, um, you know, for me, pure on the on the tax result of that, uh, that that's this statement. The, the second point, what does it bring to tax is more generically managerial in nature because you get a better control, you have a better risk management uh, control over things which reduces the risk levels overall. It also will help in reducing your compliance costs. So that is a budgetary issue which takes away a bit of the pressure from the, um, uh, the tax department that it is being seen as a cost center rather than a, a profit center as it might have been in the past. So I think these two elements, and I think the, f the last one is probably more prominent momentarily, where people are looking at um, what is the tax department doing, what is it delivering in terms of value, and what is it costing. 
I have seen already now on the multiple uh, multiple instances where CFOs are taking out the tax planners and bringing in the tax compliance uh, functions um, because they don't see the opportunity anymore on the tax planning side, but they do see the cost. So I think it's uh, it's one of these pendulums that uh, needs to be, you know, coming back again in favor of tax, and this is one of the elements to do it. Maria? Uh, thank you, and I think that's it with questions for now. So thank you for participation in the webinar, and I hope to see you again. And think next week or in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you.